Thank you very much. Um, I have a handout there, which is the one with the colored pictures on the front of it. It doesn't have my name on the front of it, so I just wanted you to know it would be associated with these remarks. What I'd like to do is rather informally cover three different interrelated topics. The first is the current state of human beings, which has been worked on a couple of times, but I want to set my own uh, situation for it. Then I want to talk about the extinction of biological diversity uh, as, as the reverse of caring for creation. It's getting rid of creation. And that has very serious consequences for us. And then I want to talk about agriculture with a special emphasis on GM crops uh, because they are so political and because this academy has considered them a number of times. <clears throat> We've already had one excellent lecture on agriculture earlier today. And uh, I would like to start with some of the same ground. Uh, as I review the evidence, the heavy use of crops uh, began about uh, 11,500 years ago, and it was about 10,000 years ago that people actually depended on crops as a major, as the major commodity that they were, and domestic animals, as the major commodities on which they were dependent. Uh, the important thing to note is that that was after 2.2 million years of existence of human beings on Earth, of people that, of our relatives that we'd call human, 2.2 million years, and they began agriculture only about 11,500 to 10,000 years ago, depending on how you date the beginnings of agriculture. However you date them, they certainly took place around the eastern end of the Mediterranean in the Fertile Crescent down into Turkey and uh, so forth. And uh, it was there that agriculture allowed uh, people to live together in larger numbers. It's very important to uh, <clears throat> remember, and it's hard to remember, and it's hard to even believe that at the time agriculture was begun, as already said, there were about 100,000, thought to be about 100,000 people in Europe. That was the total. And only about 1 million people in the entire world. <clears throat> so you can think about a part of the population of Rome spread out on all of the six habitable continents in the world. 1 million people, just a tiny, tiny fraction, only 10 to 11,000 years ago, after 2.2 million years of human history getting to that point. That's an amazingly small number, and of course their way of life was completely different from our way of life in that they lived as hunter-gatherers in groups mostly of 20 to 40 people, rarely coming in contact with one another, and basically foraging con continuously for uh, plant and animal food that they needed for subsistence. Obviously, in wandering bands of 20 to 40 people foraging in that way, there was no possibility for the development of what we now consider civilization. In other words, there was no possibility for specialization among those groups of people. <coughs> Everybody had essentially the same charge, which was to find food and reproduce and find shelter and protect themselves from animals. They rarely met other groups of people, and if they did, it was generally uh, unpleasant. They went their own way, but they normally only came in contact with their own groups. Now, when they began to have a steady source of food, then... They could uh, live in, in towns, in villages, and eventually in cities, and in those centers of civilization, build up what we call civilization at the present time. In other words, begin to form philosophy, begin to form, some people could be storytellers, other people could be ceramicists, other people could be uh, uh, architects or political figures or religious figures or whatever, 
in those groups because there was room for a specialization. <clears throat> and they began to fight about their stored food and about places where they could grow food. For example, the migration of the Israelites up the eastern side of the Mediterranean obviously went from being on the fringes in Egypt where they had no steady access to water just far enough north to get to a place where there was enough water to grow crops on their own consistently without having to irrigate. And uh, we can understand a lot of the movements of people in the ancient world that way. <coughs> um, <coughs> writing, uh, human progress was very much accelerated when writing was developed about 5,000 years ago simultaneously hieroglyphics along the Nile and cuneiform writing in, in, in uh, the Fertile Crescent in Babylonia and so forth. And of course, hieroglyphics really only spread up and down the Nile, never really became widespread, but cuneiform writing uh, gave rise to all the modern alphabets eventually and differentiated into the form of writing that we have now. Uh, writing in China, which took a very different approach, began about 500 years later, as far as we know, the earliest examples dating back to about 4,500 years ago. <clears throat> when there was writing, then of course people could record what was going on around them and they could really accelerate the growth of what we call civilization. Storytelling, poetry, notations for music, uh, rules for law, the golden rule, the Hammurabi's tablets, the uh, Bible and so forth were able to be written down and circulated and studied and used and of course civilization accelerated. <clears throat> now as people developed from that original one million people their numbers began to grow in relation to the spread of agriculture Agriculture now occupies about 40% of the ice-free land of the world, about 30% 30, about 30 of the total lands of the world. About 11% of the world is uh, crop land and about another 20% is uh, grazing land, most of it natural and most, most of it on natural grasslands and most of it unsustainable. Uh, so the 11% that's agricultural, which is divided into large-scale commercial agriculture and small-scale, uh, less organized agriculture, uh, is very large. Now, as background to the, and I'll be through the first section in a minute, as background to the next section, though, can you imagine what the spread of agriculture over 40% of the ice-free lands in the world must have meant to the survival of biodiversity? In other words, we sometimes forget in talking about agriculture today being harmful to biological diversity that the original spread of agriculture must have been the original arch enemy of biodiversity because you can in no way convert 40% of the world's land surface to agriculture without driving tens and even hundreds of thousands of species of plants and animals to extinction. A graphic example that we know about this is that the spread of the Polynesians through the islands of the Pacific uh, over the last 1,000 years resulted in the loss of about 2,000, which is an unbelievable figure, but it's documented in the fossil record, about 2,000 species of birds out of the, and we now have about 11,000 surviving, and that just gives you one fairly recent example of what agriculture does to biodiversity. <clears throat> so when people talk about GMOs or any kind of modern genetic ways of improving crops, they talk about them as being a special example of harm to biodiversity is really to miss the point. Uh, well, our numbers have grown, as I said, rather rapidly, a couple of hundred million at the time of Christ. Interestingly, at the time of Thomas Malthus, the English clergyman who talked about our ability to produce food being outstripped by our 
population growth in the 1790s, the total world population was still only about 850 million people. Uh, and as has been demonstrated, his fears were largely overcome by our ability to manufacture fertilizer, uh, artificial fertilizer to transport water from place to place, and other uh, advances in agricultural technology. At any case, uh, associated with the Industrial Revolution, which was going on at exactly the same time, at any event, the global population did not reach one billion people until Napoleonic times, about 1810. And then it took, it took 120 years until about 1930 for the global population to reach two billion people. Uh, what is uh, frightening to many of us, of course, is that that two billion in 1930 is now 7.2 billion uh, rising at the rate of 250,000 people net per day. In other words, every day when the world sits down at dinner tables, there are 250,000 more people wait, waiting to be fed than there were the day before and continuing to grow rapidly. Um, it is uh, the high point in population growth uh, in percentages was in 1971 and the percentage, the number of children per mother, measured by mothers because they're constantly uh, associated with the number of children, uh, at that has been dropping rapidly, but the base has been rising rapidly. And so that's why for me and for many people in this room, there are three times as many people in the world as there were when we were born three people for every one person. And if you consider the pressure that that puts on living systems, something that's happened, something where we're talking about less than 100 years out of the 2.2 million year history of human beings on Earth, you can see why we've uh, got serious concerns. Um, I advise all of you who want to think about pressures on the Earth to uh, consult the website footprintnetwork.org, which is the website of the Global Footprint Network, a, a group centered in Oakland, California, which calculates the effect of human beings on the global environment and updates it and also provides methods for calculating the impact of your own university or school or family or yourself or your country on global sustainability. It's probably not surprising in view of the fact that we, can, we are consuming at present about 45% of the products of photosynthesis uh, directly or indirectly are wasting them, whereas we're just one species. And about 60% of the total supplies of usable fresh water and the renewable fresh water in the world uh, that the numbers that I'm about to give you are so high, and yet we don't think about them very much. We have uh, uh, the Global Footprint Network calculated that in 1970, uh, human beings, one species, were using about 70% uh, of the world's sustainable productivity, and they calculate now that we're using about 156% of the world's sustainable productivity, which means that we are depressing the diversity, the interest, the, the heterogeneity of the world rapidly with every passing year. Or another way of looking at it is that by August of every year, we pass the point at which we're living off uh, sustainable productivity and into the point where we're depressing biological productivity and the sustainability of biological productivity to get the goods that we consider that we need. Uh, another way of looking at it that they present is that uh, we have about one, something like 1 1.8 hectares of uh, of land to support uh, every person on Earth. Uh, and in all of the countries of Europe and the United States and Japan and now China and India, we're using more 
uh, of the sustainable productivity than we actually have internally. The United States was sustainable internally until about 1970. Uh, Britain hasn't been sustainable internally for centuries, neither have some of the countries of Western Europe. Uh, China passed its uh, own sustainable productivity in about uh, 1980 and now imports more than they can grow or depend on internally. Japan depends on about seven times as much area as they have to support the people at the level of consumption at which they're accustomed or which they take for granted. That simply means that many other countries in the world have no possibility of becoming sustainable because the rich countries of the world are draining the goods, the sustainability out of uh, the poor countries. And as my colleague has said, that's a net movement of water and resources and productivity from poor countries to rich countries. That's a serious moral problem, but pressure on the earth is a combination of population, consumption levels per person, and technology. We can make improvements in technology, uh, but we are gonna have to find lower levels of consumption in order for our civilization and the things that we value in it being sustainable. And we're going to have to find a level population at some level, which is why it's very uh, notable and important that uh, successive popes have, have preached uh, worldwide that it's immoral to have more children than you can afford to raise properly and uh, that in fact the Catholic countries of the world are not the ones that are growing rapidly. The ones that are growing rapidly are Sub-Saharan Africa, India, and Asia generally. Uh, now, oh, rates of growth in the future. Well, um, my colleague uh, estimates that because of falling fertility rates and the like, we might stabilize at about nine billion people. Remember that we're already with 7.2 billion people using 150% of what the world can produce and that we're adding 250,000 per day. Uh, the UN uh, gives in their last report, which I commend to you, a range of estimates for the future and they calculate that <clears throat> we have about a 5% chance of stabilizing at, uh, at 9 billion people. But in any case, 7 billion is so far over what we can really afford that it, that it becomes kind of a moot point. And the easiest way to illustrate that is by pointing out that about 800 million people in the world are already malnourished, which means that their life experience has been such that their bodies and their brains didn't develop or couldn't develop properly. Uh, and about 100 million, the estimate varying with the source, are actually on the verge of starvation at any given time. So uh, how many more we add uh, uh, tends to neglect the fact that we're already in a horrible situation. A lot of people say, well, uh, we'll never do anything until the situation gets really grave. Well, with 800 million people in the world uh, seriously malnourished to the point where they're non-functional. Uh, half the world population living on less than two dollars, two US dollars a day, and 100 million people on the verge of starvation at any time now uh, to think about future growth and how we're gonna accommodate them is to kind of miss the point. I think that we're already on the edge of the precipice, if not, if not already down on the edge of the precipice in terms of our exhaustion of resources and the serious situation, the morally terrible situation, the awful situation for human beings is now and it undoubtedly will weaken our ability to sustain civilization in the future unless we confront it with every bit of strength that we can muster. Now let me turn briefly to biological diversity or creation. I've already pointed out to you that a, a great many species must have been exterminated during the last 10,000 years with the spread of agriculture all over the world. Uh, 
We now have a number of reasons that species are continuing to become extinct very rapidly. Uh, transforming habitat being one of the major reasons. Uh, global climate change being another reason simply by forcing everything up to the tops of the mountains and then there's no, no more tops of mountains for it to grow to. In France, for example, a lot of the alpine species that used to grow in the Alp Maritime are not there anymore. They're just further north in France on mountains. And if you're looking at it in the southern hemisphere and you're looking at something like uh, Table Mountain in Cape Town, then you're looking at a place where they have no place to migrate to. There are, there are hundreds of endemic plants on Table Mountain above Cape Town in South Africa. There are no mountains south of there, so it becomes warmer. They clearly will become extinct. The spread of invasive species around the world, including destructive insects, fungi, and other pests of plants, and the spread of mammals, which often t uh, take out plants in large numbers, the spread of weeds, which become rampant and run away, that's another reason. Finally, two-thirds of the people in the world, and this may surprise you if you hadn't had occasion to think of it, two-thirds of the people in the world, primarily in China and India, depend directly on plants as their major source of medicine, possibly having the opportunity to go occasionally to a pharmacy to buy uh, drugs that are made up. And uh, that, of course, constitutes a pressure on wild plants, which can only grow as the population grows. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, has 850 million people now and is estimated by the Population Reference Bureau to grow to 2.2 billion people by 2050, which is the middle of this century, 36 years from now. And certainly the disorder there, the difficulty of feeding people, the difficulty of bringing political freedom, or the difficulty of living comfortably in Sub-Saharan Africa can only get more difficult as the population shoots upward. Uh, but. Uh, we have to do the best we can. One of the obvious conclusions from what I'm saying is that the system of nations that we operate under doesn't operate very well. Surprise, surprise. It almost seems like a modern Tower of Babel where you have all these different groups looking for advantages for themselves or living out of the whole, but the world as a whole is sinking down the hill, down rapidly. Uh, while we each look out for our own benefit. And of course, that's an individual characteristic also. Presumably at the time when our ancestors were hunter-gatherers, the kind of greed that is bringing so much destruction and strife to modern civilization, to country versus country, to people versus people, uh, presumably greed accumulating things was a huge advantage if you were a hunter-gatherer, but now it's anything but and the overaccumulation of goods and consumption and overuse of destructive technology by wealthy nations or wealthy individuals can only bring the world to a lower state much faster than would happen in any other way. Now with all of those pressures on biological diversity, what's happening to it in the present day? One way you can begin to imagine what the historical rate of extinction of biodiversity is, and I handed out there a review paper that colleagues and I wrote on that very question that came out in Science a couple of months ago, is to look at uh, those uh, animals that have hard body parts, like vertebrate animals or like mollusks in the fossil record for the last 65, 66 million years since the end of the Cretaceous period when dinosaurs disappeared and the character of life on Earth changed. And if we do that, we find that something like 10, uh, 10 species per million per year became extinct over that 65 million year period. If we then look at the record in the last 500 years since the production of books with printed type that are that are uh, available to everyone and that can record, you know, well-known obvious species like vertebrates, birds, butterflies, and the like, we can say that it went up by an order of magnitude or two, and now we can estimate, as always by analogy with well-known groups, <coughs> because as I'll point out in a minute, we don't know very much about biodiversity, 
uh, we're losing uh, something like a thousand species per million per year. We're up a couple of orders of magnitude and rising rapidly as a result of all the forces I've talked about so that we can, we can soon enough be, be driving a majority of species on Earth to extinction, possibly by the end of this century. As if we didn't have enough reason to care about that because of our total dependence on organisms for food, for almost total dependence for medicines, uh, dependence for ecosystem services like flood control and topsoil protection and climate generation. Uh, the molecular diversity that's been revealed, and after all, we're only 50 years from the origins of molecular biology, the molecular diversity that's been revealed in the operation of genes and introns and epigenetics and all the other things we're noting uh, vary greatly from organism to organism. We have no idea, no reason, no way to tell how much they vary. But when we hear things like the load of genes in a duck-billed platypus or in an amphioxus is completely different from the load of genes in something else, and we realize how very much more subtle genetic differences are than we had thought them to be previously, we have a very good reason right there for preserving as much biological diversity as possible. We are, however, in the middle of the seventh great extinction, no doubt a proportion of species equal to that in the earlier geological extinctions uh, is underway now. And that can be justified neither pragmatically, which I've stressed just now, nor morally. Uh, in the second chapter of Genesis, it talks about man having been put on the earth to sustain and preserve it. Uh, that's not a very good job of sustaining and preserving it. And as many of my colleagues have pointed out, if a spaceship landed here from Mars and people looked at the earth, what they would find to be truly incredible would be the biological diversity of the Earth and all the living systems that it makes up on Earth, which have eventually given rise to us and eventually to our civilization, to the things that we prize. And to be destroying that wantonly, which we are right now, at a rate which has been unprecedented for the last 65 million years, is the very worst thing we could do about obtaining sustainability for generations into the future. And I very much appreciated the fact that uh, our president brought out that it's not really only a matter or particularly a matter of how our children and grandchildren will live, it's a matter of how this great edifice that we call civilization with all of its trappings and all of its accomplishments will be housed in a civilized world in a way that it can exist into the future. And doing so will require a very much more refined, a very accelerated, a very much more intense attention to biological diversity and the systems that it comprises. Now, uh, let me conclude with a few words about agriculture, about genetic improvement of agricultural crops. Um, 41 years ago, Boyer and Cohen made the first transfer of a gene from an unrelated kind of organism to, to another one, basically from uh, the colon bacterium E. coli to the African clawed toad, which we've seen illustrated a couple of times today. Uh, nobody really knew what that would do. Nobody was aware at that time of the rich existence, an abundant existence of transgenic traits in organisms that uh, exist or the terrific, uh, terrifically abundant uh, transfer, horizontal transfer of genes from one organ kind of organism to another, our president having been one of the people who realized that very early on. But the more analysis we do of genomes at the present time, for example, the idea that our genomes have about 3% viral genes in them, uh, let us know that there's nothing particularly unusual about that. Now, Maxine Singer and a number of other colleagues went to a conference in Asilomar right after the discovery of transgenics and considered very carefully how dangerous this might be and what ought to be done. And they devised a system 
uh, uh, protected labs, uh, P1, P2, and so forth, where the spread of organisms, if they were going to be dangerous, could be prevented. After a few years, it became clear that there was nothing particularly dangerous about this. One of the, uh, one of the uh, myths that we have, which has been uh, implicitly refuted by a number of the papers today, uh, is that um, there, are, there, is a, there are human genes, there are pig genes, there are chickweed genes, and there are maize genes. Actually, genes are the same. They're chemical. They can be moved from one organism to another. Obviously, their position in the, in the DNA molecules of the new organism may have an effect on their functioning, but there's nothing any more abnormal about that than there's a pianist using the same piano to turn out different melodies. It simply has to be worked on experimentally, and there's certainly nothing intrinsically dangerous about transgenic organisms. We make it very clear that we believe that, whether we'll face it or not when it comes to crops, by the fact that virtually all beer in the world, 99% is produced from the products of transgenic organisms, from enzymes produced by transgenic organisms, as is virtually all cheese in the world, uh, as, is virtually, as is virtually all bread in the world, uh, as are many of our medicines. For example, everybody takes uh, uh, insulin now, takes the product of a, of a transgenic organism. Uh, so why we should be going so crazy about uh, this process in plants, I can only speculate about. In fact, uh, in the year 2000, actually in the 1990s, in the year 2000, seven academies came together, Brazil, India, Mexico, China, the United States, the Royal Society, and so forth. That's 14 years ago, and pointed out that there was no intrinsic danger in these methods. I myself have analyzed very closely uh, what dangers might be posed by growing transgenic crops in the middle of other biological diversity, and there again, the, the effects can be viewed as effects. They don't have to be viewed, they should not be viewed as something intrinsic to the way that those particular strains were produced. Uh, in addition to that, people have been focusing recently on the point that for uh, transgenic plants have been grown for about 18 years now. Uh, they're cultivated on uh, something like one-sixth of the world's agricultural lands. Hundreds of millions of people have been eating them consistently uh, for the past 15 years, and billions of farm animals have been eating them consistently. And there's not a single case of sickness or abnormality attributed to any of that. So what are we talking about? In addition, Every academy of sciences in the world, I think, has studied this matter. Every academy of sciences in the world, including our own, in a, in a uh, colloquium in 2009 that Ingo Patrikas and Werner and others of us participated in, has agreed that there's no danger in any of this. Uh, in, there's no basic danger, and yet we still fall into the habit of saying, if that's the only way that we can produce a certain kind of trait, then we might use it, whereas it's totally illogical. It's simply one of many ways that the, genet that the structure of genes can be manipulated and are manipulated and have been manipulated in agriculture for years, but because of the GM label in giant capital letters and the association with industry, it continues to be a source of contention. Uh, one thing that I like to point out is that the evidence for global climate change uh, is that, I mean, in a way, a way of looking at the evidence for global climate change is that all the academies of sciences in the world, 99% of scientists who claim to know anything about the field uh, and so forth have concluded that global, global climate change, primarily driven by human activity, uh, exists, it is true, and that is exactly the same level of proof that exists, of scientific reasoning that exists concerning the intrinsic safety of GM crops, and yet 
uh, so-called environmentalists, and I consider myself an environmentalist, uh, espouse global climate change. What a terrible thing the corporations are doing to us. And they deny the exactly equivalent scientific evidence for, uh, for uh, the safety of genetically modified products from genetically modified plants, saying, look what a terrible thing corporations are doing to us. It seems to me that the real target are corporations. Uh, they want to attack corporations, and if you're going to attack corporations, then you just do that and the science be damned. Uh, there's, no, there's no reason to do anything else. Uh, <clears throat> my colleague Ingo Patrikas first presented uh, 15 years ago publicly his findings about golden rice. It's been amply demonstrated, redemonstrated, and shown over and over again that children um, could be spared uh, blindness uh, and be able to get sufficient supplies of vitamin A by eating something like 30 grams of golden rice uh, per day, which is a very small amount and very solid, solvable. That's been obvious for, for the last 15 years in reality with many experiments having been done in many places to strengthen the case. That's why many of us, including myself, consider it shockingly immoral for people to focus on golden rice as something to be blocked. Why? Because it has a product in it from a GM plant, an original transfer was made that Ingo has already talked about. And, and all the further improvement has not even been done by GM methodology is blocked. Something like 700,000 children a year become blind as a result of inadequate support, inadequate supplies of, uh, of uh, carotenes, vitamin A, and about half of them are more die. In fact, it's the most frequent, vitamin A deficiency is the most frequent cause of death in children two to five years old worldwide. Uh, and yet, environmental groups have the insufferable arrogance to go out and say, this is dangerous in some way because it had a GM step in its genes. Consider the fact that in China for 12 years, they've had a gene available BT, in BT rice developed at an agricultural university in Wuhan which could alleviate all the spraying on all of the rice fields of China, which is hugely damaging to human health. Uh, it's fine for Europe to say, well, we'll, you, we'll drink beer, we'll eat cheese, and we'll eat bread, but none of those GM crops, those are really something awful when Europe is so rich and so largely self-sufficient. But as our colleague, Per Penstrup Anderson, who's a very good thinker on this field, has pointed out, uh, in Europe or America, where we do have GM crops, you would consider that medicine was justified regardless of how it was produced. No diabetic would ever dream of not using insulin because it had GM uh, products in it. On the other hand, as Pinstrup Anderson pointed out, if you're a mother in Africa, disease is hunger. Disease is starvation, and we have ways of alleviating that, and yet because of worldwide insufferable arrogance, people conspire in such a way as to deny them access to this particular kind of genetic improvement, which is one of many, which is not a cure-all, which is not going to solve the world's food problems, but it's, but it's absolutely beyond reason for a scientific body like ours to condone, to allow, or to even sit silently in the face of that kind of denial, which after all only harms people. It seems to me that it says to the Bible, it says in, in Matthew, in the Bible, that which you do to the least of my brethren you do unto me. Uh, believe me, if we deny by example, by phony trade laws, by misunderstandings, by scientific misapplications, this particular form of genetic breeding to people in Africa or Asia, we're ignoring completely that kind of injunction which many of us find completely appealing. I hope that we can get out of this. Uh, India was doing very well with this uh, when an arrogant uh, 
uh, egotistical self-promoter named Vandana Shiva began rushing around giving speeches and claiming that she had the true cross, she knew everything, and it was all going to be okay if we just listened to her. China was doing well on this until so-called Greenpeace, which is a disgusting name to me in view of their actual activities, came into China and made the government afraid. The problem is that politicians, if they hear a lot of yabba, 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 then they want to take, the easiest thing for them to do is make no decision at all until their term of office is over. And yet, the people who die, their blood should be on their hands and their blood should be on the hands of people like Greenpeace who simply support their not-for-profit organizations by sell selling scientific falsehood worldwide. I hope that the church, the Pope, might be able to take a stronger stand on this and might be able to lead a consortium to get us out of this cul-de-sac because it is really immoral, unacceptable, inhuman, and tragic kind of behavior. Uh, those are the remarks that I wanted to make on those three subjects, and uh, thanks for the time, and uh, I hope we'll be able to, in general discussion of this, be able to think of taking some action from our academy on these matters. Thank you.